Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the 15th iteration of our Tech Stocks webinar series. My, my name is Javier Montamena. I am the Manager of Engineering Professional Development Programs for Texas Engineering Executive Education, TechSE for short, which is the Continuing and Professional Education Provider of the Copco School of Engineering at UT Austin. Before we get rolling, we'd like to quickly cover some housekeeping items. After we're finished with introductions, our speaker will present for approximately 40 minutes, and afterwards we will have a moderated Q&A session. Speaking of Q&A, at the right-hand side of your screen, you'll see a Q&A window. If you have a question you'd like to ask our speaker, please make sure to submit it there. Or if you like a question that's been submitted, make sure you upvote it. You can also use this window to contact our behind the scenes team if you're experiencing technical difficulties or if you have a more general question. In addition, a recording of this webinar will also be available later today on our YouTube channel. Lastly, if you'd like to receive continuing education credits for attending this webinar, stay tuned for more information on how to request those at the end of the webinar. We are excited to have you with us today for what's sure to be an incredibly insightful and interesting conversation on unlocking energy at sea, design of offshore platforms for oil, gas, and wind energy. For more than 100 years, people have endeavored to unlock hydrocarbon resources beneath sea. In the earliest days, clever engineers used long piers jutting out in the ocean and lakes. Today, energy is harvested from coastal locations to hundreds of miles from shore and water depths up to 3,000 meters using fixed and floating offshore platforms. The evolution of technology and innovation in the design of fixed and floating offshore platforms has been integral to the success of the offshore energy industry. This talk will focus on the history of offshore structures and an introduction to the wide range of structural types and the skills needed to design, build, and install them. This topic is actually a key part of the fundament Fundamentals of Offshore Engineering Professional Certificate Program offered by TechSE. Stay tuned for more information about this program towards the end of the webinar. Without further ado, I will hand it off to our moderator for today, Dr. Spiros Kinnis. Dr. Kinnis is the Matlock Hudson Professor in the Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering at UT Austin. He holds a PhD from Ocean Engineering at MIT and a diploma from Naval Architecture and Marine Energy at the National Technical University of Athens, Greece. He is in charge of the Ocean Engineering Graduate Program at UT Austin and the Associate Director of the Offshore Technology Research Center. His expertise are in the area of computational hydrodynamics with applications on the propulsion and control of ocean vehicles and offshore structures, as well as on the design of marine turbines for the extraction of energy from ocean currents. Lastly, he is the faculty in charge of the previously mentioned Fundamentals of Offshore Engineering Professional Certificate Program. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Kinnis. Handing it off to you. Thank you, Javier. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, since I know we have an international crowd. It's uh, with great pleasure that um, I will introduce today today's uh, speaker, Dr. Steve Hodges. Steve has been a part of the offshore industry for the last 35 years. 30 years of which he has been with Shell, involved in design, construction, and installation of most of the Shell deep water developments in different uh, type of aspects, hydrodynamics, global performance, structural design, construction site engineering project, and organizational management. In the last years, he was the engineering manager for ISA systems for many years, and the last five years, at Cell, he was the senior technical authority responsible for development and maintenance of technical standards and technical insurance for major projects, as well as coaching and mentoring junior engineers and looking after their career development. Since his retirement uh, about a year ago, Steve still is very active. He's uh, involved with API committees and consulting, as well as helping young professionals coaching, career coaching and mentoring. Um, Steve teaches in one of these uh, courses on offshore structures that we have at UT. And uh, his background is, uh, he has his BS in civil engineering from Northwestern University, his master's and PhD from UC Berkeley in naval architecture and offshore engineering. And his focus in at the time was on hydrodynamics and ship motions. Uh, Steve, all yours. Thank you, Professor Aquino. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to this, and uh, I think we'll have some fun today. So uh, let me find my place. 
So today we're going to talk about offshore platforms, and I want to dispel the notion a little bit that you know this is all an oil and gas thing because there's many, many uses for offshore platforms in our future and in our past. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. When Professor Keenis invited me to talk about offshore platforms with you guys today, I got really excited about all the exciting things I could share, and then he has since reminded me more than once that I only get 35 to 40 minutes. So. Uh, I'm going to have to cherry pick the most useful things. So after some careful thought, what I'd really like you to take away from today is the basic understanding of where we've come from and where we're going in the world of offshore platforms and maybe just a little bit of physics that goes with it. So <clears throat> what do I want you to take away today? Uh, basically, one, I think a sense of the history and the path forward and how that ties into our energy future where it involves offshore platforms. Two, what types of platforms are there and what makes them useful and unique? And in this context, we'll talk about both fixed platforms and my favorite floating platforms. And we'll also talk just a little bit about what it takes to design them, okay? So let's talk about offshore platforms. What are they used for today? Well, quite obviously oil and gas, and that's been the preponderance of the use in the last century or so. Uh, but also wind energy, and I'm sure you're probably aware if you've been anywhere in Texas, you know, wind power makes up almost 20% of our power grid here in Texas, and uh, offshore is coming along quickly. Now in Europe, it's been really the leaders, Europe have been the leaders in offshore wind farms, but the first major offshore wind farm in the U.S. waters did come on stream uh, not long ago off Rhode Island, and there are projects in the works off Cape Cod, New Jersey, and other locations. Uh, <clears throat> But what about other things? What about wave energy? So when I was a student, graduate student in Berkeley back in the 80s, this was actually a big topic. There was a lot of work going on and there was really a lot of interesting engineering. It wasn't seen in economic, as economic at the time, but in our changing vision of where energy comes from, it uh, is, is gaining new life. And there's a lot of interesting things going on there. And of course, things like aqua farming, uh, from fish farming to uh, various uh, algae-based uh, energy storage systems that people are looking at, lots of interesting stuff around that. Ocean thermal energy conversion, or OTEC as it's known, uh, basically uses very cold water from deep in the ocean as a heat exchanger with warm water above. And some of you may be familiar with similar geothermal heat pump technology onshore. In fact, there actually are home systems where they'll dig a deep uh, well in your yard. Um, so this has been in the works for decades, but is actually coming to fruition in places like Hawaii. And it's, it's very attractive in Hawaii because the surface water is very warm, obviously near the equator. But Hawaii is a, is a volcanic uh, island uh, grouping, an atoll. So it drops off very, very quickly. So they have easy access to very cold deep water uh, as well as the warm water very close to shore. But this is something that can be used both as like like wave energy and wind energy can be used as a global power source, if you will, to power normal power plant things, but can also be used locally to power facilities and things like that, particularly offshore. Tidal currents, uh, this is almost a no-brainer when it comes to available energy. The challenge is how to safely and efficiently harness it. You can't obviously block the entire shipping lanes with, with turbines and things, but these are things that, that are being done. And there are also just various combinations of these things that have been looked at. This particular concept involves wave energy, solar energy, and wind energy. Presumably you could power all kinds of scientific outposts and whatever you need to be working on. So you can see kind of the potential of where we come from, where we're going, but to know where we came from, we need to think about a little bit of, talk a little bit about history. So let's wind back the clock and talk about how we got here. I want you to put kind of your, your, your thinking hat on is to, to put yourself in the place of the engineers of the day and what they were thinking. So onshore wells, we'll just start talking about because that's the basics, right? Onshore wells are fairly straightforward. You find a target. So I've kind of sketched in some little reservoirs here. Um, <clears throat> and then you drill straight down. Your well control is at the surface. The biggest challenges are really surface rights and roads and logistics. And when the oil boom hit places like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Southern California, and Texas in the late 19th century, and we're talking, you know, 130, 40 years ago, uh, the local landscape became inundated with wells. Because once you found a reservoir, you simply plopped down a rig and, and you drilled. But what happens when you realize that the reservoir actually extends out past your shoreline? 
So that was kind of the next step. So <clears throat> you may find this astounding, but there was actually a patent filed in 1869 for an offshore platform concept. And this patent was never actually exercised directly that I'm aware of, but you can kind of see it's really the basics. You basically have a derrick here, which is probably some structure added to it. Uh, to support the well, you have a rock drill, which was the typical drills of, of the day. This is not a sophisticated operation in, in, in 1869. And you had a boat next to it, basically, to, to service that. It's your basic offshore platform. So by the 1890s, there actually were platforms. This was in Grand Lake St. Mary's in Ohio. Uh, and it's, you can see, it's, as far as you can see, there's, there's derricks working. If you went to visit this lake today, it is a beautiful recreational area. This is in uh, western western central Ohio. Uh, obviously, this has all been cleaned up and removed, and, and, and but this is what it looked like at that point. If you went to Venezuela in this time period, Lake Maracaibo, Caddo Lake, some of you from Texas may know <clears throat> the Texas-Louisiana border. This is what it looked like around the, the turn of the century. So there was a lot of things going on with basic rudimentary platforms. Uh, this is uh, probably a little bit shocking if you've ever been to California, but this is Venice, California. Now, if you looked at Venice Beach today, it doesn't look like this. But what you can see is by mid-century, basically, they were creeping right out to the shoreline trying to chase those things. And, you know, really, what were they chasing in the early days? Well, seeps and natural seeps like La Brea tar pits, or you've seen that, or basically hydrocarbons right at the surface. Off uh, the coast of Santa Barbara, there are many natural seeps. So, so it wasn't super sophisticated. So whoops. so what happens when we need to go a little bit offshore? We need to dip our toes past the shoreline. Well, if you put your engineering hat on, you're thinking what I'd really like to do is bring my same kit along, right? I want to bring that same derrick and the same technology and my same drilling technology, whatever it is of the day. Say we're in 1952 Venice and we're wanting to, to step out offshore there. Uh, <clears throat> so basically, the first quote unquote offshore wells were really uh, offshore rigs set out on piers. And this technique was actually pioneered in Venezuela and Lake Maracaibo and in Southern California in the early 20th century, with some piers as long as 300 feet. And this is a picture of mid century of uh, near Santa Barbara. And you can just see, you know, the same derricks, the same activities just on these, frankly, rather rickety looking piers. So you know, that's kind of the, the beginning beginning ideas of, hey, how am I going to do this? Well, let's just move it out there. Now, what happens when we find a reservoir that's a bit further out? Now, this obviously wasn't happening in 1890, but as seismic technologies and whatnot came along, people realized that in places like the Delta of Mississippi River, on the continental shelf, there were, in fact, accumulations of hydrocarbons. So first engineer says, well, how do I get my rig out there? I want to use that same rig I always used. I don't have any better technology, but I can't really build a pier 10 miles out into the sea. So they basically built a structure underneath the platform that was set on bottom. <clears throat> and again, the onshore rigs and the simple onshore production facilities could be used to replace the rigs that, that uh, were done on onshore. And <clears throat> Excuse me. Basically, you have your close to a modern offshore platform. This is just a very typical platform. You can see the well risers or conductors going down here. You can see some semblance of a process facility. There's a drilling derrick, some accommodations, uh, cranes, etc. So, <clears throat> excuse me. What was more challenging as you go out here is you no longer have direct access to your pier, so you need barges and supply boats and whatnot. Uh, you need crew transport and, and other things. So where do we go next? Well, turns out you could find bigger hydrocarbon accumulations in deeper water as you go off the continental shelf. Well, what do you do with that? Well, first thought, of course, because we're engineers and we like to, to use what, what we know, uh, we said, well, can I bring my derrick with me? Can I bring it out there and drill it? Well, now you've got some complicating factors because you can't build a structure that's thousands of feet deep. In fact, the, the deepest offshore, typical basic offshore jacket structure, steel structure or concrete, is about 1,300 feet of water, and that's the Bullwinkle platform. There are some exceptions, but we're not going to go there. Basically, it's not economically viable to do that, so you end up with some kind of a floating system. And that brings on a whole host of new challenges, and we'll talk about that as we go forward. So, 
Before we go there, let's talk about what does it take to design an offshore platform in general. We'll start with functional requirements. What is it going to do? Is it out there to produce a small accumulation of oil and gas? Is it a large oil and gas facility? Is it a gas compression station for pipelines? Is it a uh, power substation for bringing in, say, 100 different wind turbines uh, to, to, to transform and send to shore? Where is it going to be installed? Not just geographically, but what does the, the bottom top topography look like? How is it situated with respect to shipping lanes or, or other hazards? Uh, how long does it need to operate? Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years? Has a huge impact on fatigue design, corrosion design, and all kinds of other things. Regulatory requirements. What is the regulatory environment where you're at? You need to make sure that they're in full compliance, and oftentimes this requires a lot of planning, and uh, you need to make sure that's dialed into the schedule. Payload. What does this thing weigh? How big does the structure need to be to support it? What all is involved in the payload? Accessibility. Is this a manned platform? Is it manned all the time? Is it manned occasionally? Do you just come visit it to, to check it out? What kind of uh, boat access, helicopter access, emergency evacuation, uh, lifeboats, all those things are very important. Means for importing or exporting, whether it's oil, gas, or power. You've got wells coming in. You've got risers to bring them in, risers to send them off to shore. You've got umbilicals, power controls, chemical injection, uh, all those things to consider. And you've got your mid-ocean conditions, your winds, your waves, your currents, your tides, um, and other things. And in some locations, you have seismic conditions and ice conditions. If you're in the Gulf of Mexico, you're not going to be concerned about this. But if you're offshore Nova Scotia or someplace like that, both are going to come into play. So these are the things that you need to know about, and you need to have the engineers to do that. This is your basic offshore platform. This is a uh, typical steel fixed platform. We call it a jacket, which seems like an odd name. But that actually is called that because the lateral the basic design of a jacket is to do with lateral load and overturning moment, and that is all resisted by piles at the foundation. And the, the earliest platforms were basically just piles that ran up through the legs of a platform, and that platform was just a jacket literally for those piles. Now today, like this one, you actually see skirt piles, and there are not piles running through uh, the legs here. They're all attached to the foundation, but that the name carries on. So you'll, you'll see this called a jacket. Uh, what kind of loads do we have? Well, we have all the static loads of your top size facility, which is the primary vertical load, and you have some dynamic loads with the drilling rig. You have a lot of, uh, wherever you have drilling, you have a lot of consumables coming on board. You have drill pipe, you have casing that's going down hole, you have uh, drilling mud and all kinds of other things that are coming on the platform and going off the platform. But from a dynamic perspective, your biggest loads are your wind, wave, and current loads. And the wave loads will impart some vertical loading as well. But the, the primary global design of a fixed platform is really that overturning moment and, and resisted by the foundations. You also have a lot of details to design for the truss work to transfer all those loads between these piles. And you have fatigue. And so these joints here are a lot of work in terms of joint geometry, in terms of well design, in terms of material selection to make sure that you have a duct pile uh, type of a, a fatigue design. So all those things come into play. I should mention that not all fixed platforms are made of steel. There are quite a few that are made of concrete, and there's some very basic ones made of concrete in various nearshore activities. And there are also these rather spectacular, uh, what they call con deep or concrete deep platforms. This happens to be an artist rendition of the Troll A platform operated by Equinor and it is about 900 feet from the base to the deck. And one of the interesting things about these condeeps is they're primarily built in Norway because Norway, when the oil boom came to the North Sea, Norway was essentially a small fishing country, it was not heavily industrialized, particularly around construction. They didn't have a large steel fabrication workforce or industry. They don't have a lot of flat places on the coast to, to build fabrication yards. It's quite easy to, to, to fabricate a jacket if you have flat coastal areas and you have welding and other crafts that are associated with steel fabrication. Concrete is actually easy to build up and take down. It's an easy industry to start from. It doesn't require highly skilled labor and it employs a lot of people. So it was perfect for Norway and they had these beautiful deep fjords where they could actually build things like this. So they would build the base of it in a graving dock and then move it out into the fjord and slowly lower it down as they slip formed 
up to the top and the fjords are deep enough that you can actually lower it enough to lift your decks right there in the protected area. So it's really a kind of a neat coincidence and, and from an engineering perspective, using every available resource to, to, uh, to its maximum. Jackets tend to be built on their side in the flat. You can see this is a rather large jacket. It's being uh, loaded out right now in this picture onto a barge, which you can just barely see because it overhangs it uh, so much. You can see the skidways here, but you can also see a good chance to look at the top of the jacket. You can see the uh, well conductor slots and you can see the conductors pre-installed here and some of them are going in different directions for directional uh, drilling of the wells and things. So uh, pretty massive. Nothing more spectacular than the launch of a jacket off a barge. You can see the barge has been uh, uh, basically trimmed down into the water to the point where the jacket slides off. And if you go on YouTube, you can see some really cool videos of, of that in action. Uh, this is just a shot of a typical con deep under construction. You can see a small sailboat here. That's probably not that small for scale there. So a few more shots of typical fixed platforms. This is just a simple wellhead platform, simplest as they come. Imagine you cut this off and put a wind turbine right on it. Um, this is a very typical production platform. You've got some production facilities here on the, 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 the right. You've got a flare, a couple cranes, you've got a drilling rig, you've got a small accommodations block, you can see the well conductors. This one, I believe, is probably a pipeline compressor station just from the looks of it, but I, I don't know for certain, but again, another variation. What about floating platforms? Well, I want to show you just a little bit of video here to give you an impression of the forces of nature that bring onto an offshore platform, and then we'll talk about the specifics of floating platforms. But you know, one of the big differences, a floating platform has to handle the same loads, you know, wind, wave, and current are the same environment as a fixed platform, but it also has to provide the buoyancy to support it, and it has to withstand the motions, and in particular, the motions are going to pull on our risers and our mooring system. So we no longer have basic conductors that are fixed to our fixed platform to allow us to uh, structurally support them to the seabed. Now we've got this floating structure, whatever it looks like, I've just drawn a blob. And you've got our handy dandy uh, drilling rig that we've carried on all the way from our earliest onshore ventures, right? Obviously they've gotten more sophisticated, but my sketch is not. And let's imagine that uh, this is a marine riser. This is carrying a well from the seabed to here, or maybe it's carrying flow from another well, subsea well somewhere, but it's got to get from here to there. And when our floating platform moves, that thing is gonna get yanked around quite a bit. Um, and so we really have a problem because it isn't fixed like a fixed platform. So. To illustrate this better, we're going to go to uh, a, a much more simpler analog that I hope we can all understand. A simple beach ball. Now, everybody has played with a beach ball in your life, whether it's in the ocean or in a lake or in a swimming pool. We all kind of know what a beach ball does. It floats on the top of the water. Probably doesn't sit quite this low in the water, but let's call it a very heavy beach ball. So it sits on top of the water. It can float around. The wind blows. It's probably going to roll all the way over here but it's it's basically a stable thing. But now what happens when the waves come along? Well, our beach ball rides right up to the top of the crest here, right? So it starts to move and it goes into the trough and it drops down and it moves on up the next crest and so forth. And basically the center of that ball is staying right at the same location above the water surface. So it rides the waves. Now, Ships and offshore platforms don't exactly ride the waves like this, and a well-designed offshore platform tries to minimize it, uh, maybe 60% you know, of the wave. So it's still moving a lot. But the beach ball, I think, is easier for us to get our minds around. So now imagine you've taken your beach ball and you're at the beach or you're at the lake or you're in a pool, and you tie a string to it. Maybe it's got a grommet there that you can tie a string to, and you take a, a rock and you tie the other end to that rock to anchor it, to the bottom of the lake or the pool or wherever you're at. And you let it float, but you've got this sort of anchor to it, right? So it's gonna float around and maybe blow a little bit to the side and then the anchor will take hold and it'll come back and, and it'll kind of stay where you want it. But what happens when the waves come along? Because as we just showed, it's gonna float 
with the with the waves, right? It's gonna float like that. So here come the waves. Yikes! Ouch! So now it's pulling on your string because that thing has a lot of buoyancy and it's gonna float right up. And you're gonna put a lot of load into your your anchor there, your string, and then it comes down in the trough and it's gonna kind of buckle it because your string isn't really uh, particularly strong in compression, nor are our risers. And we go on up to the next crest and boom again. So sooner or later, the snap load is going to break that, that string and, and, and you're going to be in trouble and your beach ball is going to go blowing off down the, the, the beach to somebody else's uh, house. So that's not going to work when we're talking about you know hydrocarbon wells offshore, obviously. That's not a good idea. So what do we do with it? Well, one of the ways we, we address that is with motion compensation mechanisms, which we call the tensioner system. They basically relieve the stress by stroking up and down to maintain essentially a constant tension in the riser. So it's a little bit hard to explain, I guess, in words, but basically, no matter where you are on the way, the top of the riser, the black piece here, stays in the same place while the tensioner system moves up and down. Now for a drilling rig, uh, like a deep water drilling rig, that tensioner system is a whole bunch of sheaves and cables that are running all over the deck and basically in weights, so it, it runs up, when, when, when the riser runs up, these things all run in and out, and it, it, it does its job, but you're talking about you know, 30, 40, 50 feet of riser stroke. So by the time you imagine how many cables and shivs you'd have to lay out to compensate for that, you really can only have one riser. You can't put a bunch of risers on this uh, moving platform like this is bouncing up and down. The second way we address this are what we call catenary risers, and there are what are called flexible risers, which are complicated mechanical things that can bend quite handily, but are very, very expensive. Or there are steel catenary risers, which is essentially a pipeline that you've laid on the seabed, and you pick the end up and hang it from your platform. Now, this is not to scale. You wouldn't do it in this shallow of water if this were to scale, but you know this is a big pipeline but in a couple thousand feet of water, it is very, very flexible. And so what happens when you move with the waves is yes, it picks up a little bit off the bottom and then it sets back down on the bottom, but through the whole catenary here, we call the sag bend, there really is almost no change in geometry and is almost completely displacement controlled. So your stress really hardly changes at all, except at where you picked it up and set it down, where you're going from tangential on the seabed to, to the catenary, and where you hang it off. So those are the areas of attention for the design. But it's a pretty simple, straightforward. If you're an engineer, always good to think simple first. This was invented by some shell engineers for our first uh, big deep water platform, the Auger TLP, in the early 1990s. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on risers, though we can have you come to the, the, the floating system course, but you can learn more about that. But let's talk a little bit about the different varieties of floating platforms. So there are four basic categories, but there are many, many variations within. And I know if you're familiar with this, you're immediately going, oh, well, what about this? You didn't include this? Yes, yes, I'm, I'm just trying to keep it simple today, but there are all kinds of variants and very creative solutions have been developed over the, the decades. But we're just going to put them in four buckets. We have the semi-submersible, which is a floating system that uh, does, it, it minimizes its motions by some clever design of the columns of the pontoons. That's why it's this odd configuration. You have spars, which are kind of based on a classic spar buoy, which have been around for centuries. Uh, it's a very clever design because the, the motions are limited by the small water plane. Um, the stability, if you're a naval architect, you'll say, wait a minute, that's completely unstable. You can't have that small of a water plane. The stability is, comes from a huge amount of weight that you put at the keel of this thing that makes it essentially an in, a pendulum, inverted pendulum. So it's inherently stable, actually. This is called a tension leg platform or a TLP. And its unique feature is that it has virtually no vertical motion. A spar will move up and down. A semi will move up and down. The, uh, the spar actually has a unique feature that because of its way it's arranged, they can run top tension risers through it and they use what they call a buoyancy can um, tensioner system. So even if they have 30 feet of stroke, it's just a buoyancy can moving up and down in a sleeve inside this, this big can here. So you don't have all the lines running all over the deck and that problem. That's, that's a pretty cool solution. A TLP can actually use basically an onshore type rig 
uh, variation because you don't have any really appreciable vertical motion. But you pay for that. And finally, you have an FPSO, which is a ship shape solution. And its unique feature is that it has storage. So if you're in a place where you don't have pipelines, which is most of the world, you can store and offload the, uh, the, 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 the production. The big disadvantage is uh, the motions are a lot worse. So all of these are trade-offs. And I, one thing I've learned in my career, and everybody kind of has their favorite concept, particularly engineering companies and people selling the concepts, but the reality is um, the, the rule I've always found is for the same functionality, the same functional requirements, the court costs the same. It's really what you need, need of it to do. And you can optimize depending on what your requirements are. <clears throat> The corollary to that is if you have unique local circumstances, that's going to drive it. You look at the, 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 the concrete uh, platforms in the fjords of Norway, etc. Okay, a little bit more history here. This was the very first floating drilling system. It was called the Blue Water. It uh, was drilling wells for Shell. Uh, it was actually an evolution. Back in the 1950s, they used what they called a submersible drilling rig, and they looked a lot like this but they would float them out to the site and then they would sink them to the bottom and they would put a lot of ballast in, hold it on bottom, drill their wells, and then float up again, go off to the next site. And there was a bright young uh, naval architect working at Shell called Bruce Collip who looked at this and noted that the uh, handling characteristics while it was in transit were actually really nice. And he went back to the scratching his head and doing some calculations and invented what we know today as the semi-submersible. So, it's an odd name if you've never heard it before, but that's where the origin comes from. It looks like a submersible, but it is only semi. Uh, now, there's a lot of physics to do with why this has great motion characteristics. And I promise if you come to the floating systems class, I will explain it to you there, but I don't have time today. But it basically has to do with the narrow columns spread out far apart and these broad pontoons that support it. So. This is a semi-submersible on a transport barge. It's just been offloaded from the, the shipyard. You can see on it, um, these are riser porches where we hang some of those steel catenary risers. These are mooring fair leads where the mooring system will go and they're on each corner. You can see a big processing module here on the deck, big cranes, flare tower, et cetera. So what's great about a semi? Well, you have reduced motions compared to a ship or a barge. You have a uh, lateral mooring system to hold it in place. You can support a single top tension drill riser, or you can support many flexible and catenary risers. Typical application, this is a subsea development. What you see is a semi-submersible here with a very large uh, production process facility on it. This is one of the bigger uh, semi-submersible developments out there. It's moored to the seabed. And then miles away, and this is not the scale, you have these drill centers where you have these clusters of wells that are manifolded and flowed back to the platform uh, through these catenary risers. They're processed to separate the oil and gas and then exported to uh, shore. There's a picture of this particular platform on our way out to sea. I did have the pleasure of working on the design of that to a certain degree. And it, it's a really cool platform. It's called Appomattox. So how about spars? So spars, their unique feature obviously is they're very tall and deep. Typically, from the deck to the keel might be as much as 600, 650 feet. The vertical motions are reduced significantly because the small water plane pushes the natural period out quite a ways. Again, come to the floating systems class in, the, uh, in June, and I will explain all of that. A uh, similar mooring system, as I mentioned before, it can support a small number of top tension risers, typically nine in sort of a three by three configuration, as well as flexible and steel catenary risers. Now, spars are built on their side, unless you have a giant fjord, and no one's done that with a spar. They're built on their side, and they're transported uh, to site like this. So this is a spar being towed out to the installation site. Here she is having arrived on site. This is a very large derrick barge called the Tealf, owned by Harama, and it's going to be used to upend the spar, and we'll also ballast into the uh, hard tanks here at the same time. And there's some cool videos out there and, and animations you can find in various websites, including the Shell uh, YouTube site. If you look for Perdido, you'll find all kinds of cool videos of this particular spar. Here it is on its way up and finally in place. And at this point, prior to this point, they then installed the solid ballast into this keel tank, which sunk it down a bit. 
And that is actually a slurry of magnetite, which is a very heavy sort of ore uh, that is pumped into it. And then it settles in there and it's pretty well permanently in place. So you do have to be very careful to do it right. And there is one that wasn't done quite right and it has a permanent heel to it. And then you're ready to set the deck. Disadvantage of as far as you have to set the deck offshore after you've upended it and installed it. Floating production storage and offloading in FBSO, it's pretty much what it says. It's got a, uh, it has a production system, it's got storage uh, and offloading. It can be converted from an old tanker to do a new. It's ideal where you don't have pipeline infrastructure, which is most of the world. So it's by far the most common offshore uh, floating platform. It has bad roll motions. A ship, you know, you know ship captains always point into the, the seas in rough weather because if a ship like this gets in beam seas, she rolls like a pig. So you have to be careful of that and to minimize that, they often have a turret and it will weather vane around this turret and the risers, this, this one is in transit, so you don't see the risers and the, the mooring lines, but they come off that turret. So the turret stays stationary and the, the FPSO spins about it with the weather. Uh, you can use flexible risers primarily, although there have been a couple of cases of catenary risers. They're also, although mostly permanently moored, they can also be designed to disconnect for things like hurricane evacuation. This shows one for the Gulf of Mexico, and here you see the turret. This one is built into the strip structure, whereas the previous one was, was external. And here's a cutaway view that kind of shows the inner workings of the turret, and this yellow part here basically can disconnect, and it will drop slowly to a location several hundred feet below the FPSO, and it will then find equilibrium there and wait there for the return. Here's a picture of that the, the part that drops just before it was uh, shipped to site. So some pretty cool technology that goes into all of that. Tension Lake platform, one of my favorites. It's moored by vertical tendons, and so the vertical motion is virtually non-existent. The beauty of that is you can support a lot of top tension risers directly to wells. So if you want to develop a very large reservoir, like the Mars Reservoir, um, where we have two large TLPs, you can see one in the background, that's Mars A, that's Mars B, and, and can also be used for very small platforms. How does the TLP work? Well, here's our friend, the beach ball again. So imagine we're back in the lake there or in the pool and we've tied our string to the beach ball into an anchor and we've anchored it to the seabed here. And then we put it, we'll, in TLPs, we call that mooring a tendon. Now, the next step is the important part. This is the magic. You're gonna, you're in there, you've got your beach ball, and you're gonna try to pull that beach ball underwater. And I'm sure you've all, you know, <laughs> tried to push a beach ball down at some point in your life, and you realize there's a lot of buoyant force there. That's the whole magic of the system. You basically pull that down. So now you have a lot more buoyancy which means you have a lot more vertical force. So this beach ball is no longer in uh, static equilibrium. If you were to cut this tendon, it would go flying back up to this position. So you're in a, a, a situation where the mooring line is now pretensioned. So when the water rises, the tension increases and the water goes down, the tension decreases. So if we, how far do we need to pull that ball down? Well, that's part of the secret is you need to pull it enough so it always remains in tension. And that's trickier than maybe it sounds because the more you pull it down, the more displacement, the higher the wave loads, the higher the wave loads, the more displacement and the larger the tendon. And it's a, it's a, a complicated iterative process and it's a lot of fun and interesting to do. I spent the first several years of my career working in that area. So now we've got it moored here and the waves come along and instead of yanking on it and breaking it, we have a, a design for it, there's no yanking. Um, it rides up out of the waves here. So at this point, it's, it's pulling less tension. Here it's starting to pull a little more tension. Here it's pulling even more tension, and here it's pulling less. Now, I've exaggerated this. Obviously, that doesn't have much pretension left, but it can move laterally, nice and smooth, but the center stays at the same place. So if we translate that to a more complicated actual TLP, we in fact find that our riser, and remember way back uh, about a dozen slides ago, I had the one where it was yanking on this riser and buckling it, etc. Well, now we've got this really lovely arrangement. So that's the beauty of the TLP. Here's a few shots of typical TLPs. This first one was the first uh, deep water TLP in the Gulf of Mexico. It's a small wellhead platform. These two went off to Equatorial Guinea. This is uh, Marco Polo in the Gulf of Mexico, and there's Olympus, which I showed you earlier. 
Okay, let's have one last look at the various platform types that we've talked about. So we had fixed platforms, we have SPARs, we have TLPs, we have FPSOs, we have some we haven't addressed, but this is what's called by some people an LNG FPSO or FLNG, floating LNG. Uh, this is intended for uh, large gas reservoirs that are stranded, that are remote, they're not near a, a place that will consume gas, so they don't have a market. What it is, is basically there's at the, uh, at the bow, there's a standard gas processing facility for the wells coming in. And then adjacent to it is a cryogenics uh, facility to, uh, to liquefy the, the gas. And then you'll bring natural LNG tankers up alongside and offload to them in, in tandem fashion. You can see here the offloading rigs right there. There's one that has been built. It's called Prelude in Australia and there are possibly more on the way. What about wind power generation? Here you see a basic, this basic fixed platform, right? Like we showed you all through here, except on top, we've got wind turbines. And what you don't see here is there's also, well, here you see the power line going out. So that's their riser essentially, it's power umbilical. Each of these uh, turbines, there might be a hundred in the field, feed over to a substation nearby on a, on a, on a fixed platform typically. And uh, there it's uh, transformed and sent to shore. You can also put these same turbines in all, all the same platform concepts we talked about, as well as the offshore substations. You've got your spars, your semis, your TLPs, and your fixed platforms. So pretty cool stuff. What skill sets does it take to design an offshore platform? Well, we need our med ocean engineers. If you're not familiar with the lingo, that's meteorology and physical oceanography combined. And we just can't say all of that, so we say med ocean. <laughs> Uh, and they're absolutely essential. The uh, structural engineers, you don't need a lot of the Ocean engineers, but you need a really good one. Uh, your geotechnical engineers to design the foundations, uh, your naval architects like myself for the, for the floaty boaty bits, as we say, mechanical engineers for the mooring systems and risers, materials, welding, corrosion engineer for all the components, health, safety, and environment specialists to make sure that this is a safe and, and, and place to work. Uh, we need project managers to keep it all moving along, and we always need the contracts and procurements folks and quality control and quality assurance, uh, regulatory specialists. There's one, one last topic I want to share with you because I realize I'm running out of time here, and this is decommissioning. And it, sometimes decommissioning projects get in the news for all the wrong reasons, but most of the decommissioning is done in, in a very clever way. So plug and abandon the wells, make sure that they're safe. Obviously, the top sides are removed and taken to shore and, and recycled or done with. The jacket itself can either be removed and taken to shore or what happens more and more frequently is they're laid on the seabed. Now, if you're a fisherman uh, and you like to fish in, in the open water, you already know this, but offshore platforms are heaven for fish. And we, Oh, many countries, including the U.S., have developed rigs to reefs programs where basically they take these platforms that are laid on the seabed and basically turn them into playgrounds for uh, aqua life. And they're great diving locations if you've ever been to the flower gardens off the coast of Texas here and, and other places. So it's a really nice way to, to put to rest uh, something that served its, its useful life. So where do we go from here? What's next? Well, there's all kinds of... Uh, I hope your mind is energized by the prospects for the future as we move into an energy transition period here in the coming decades where we're going to have existing technology is going to meet new technology uh, to bring energy safely to where it's needed. This is just kind of a cool slide that comes from a study done in Europe called the Oceans of Tomorrow and numerous companies participated coming up with ideas for things that uh, could be done in the ocean. And not surprising to me anyway, all of them are going to require some kind of offshore platform structural support for it. So pretty exciting stuff. And uh, that's pretty much the end of what I have to say. I'm going to, there, there are some references and things if you want to do some additional reading, I'm going to flash them up here for a couple of seconds. You can freeze frame them on the video later if you're interested. I'm not going to talk about them, but uh, some really interesting uh, reading if you, if you want to learn more. And particularly this OTC session is a lot of really good history. Last year's OTC uh, history of the different platform concepts I, I mentioned. I you know, just kind of mentioned the authors here. Uh, really interesting reading. And that's pretty much it. I think I hit my time mark. How are we doing, Javier?
It's uh, you're doing very well, Steve. Uh, this is Spiros. Um, can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, first of all, a very insightful uh, lecture. I like the beach ball uh, analogy that helps. Uh, I think that was very great uh, to see. And um, also I like the the patent that you mentioned, the 1869 patent, which actually is probably the first FPSO, right? <laughs> type of FPSO. So again, it was very nice to see all these different aspects of, um, or if you like, different types of uh, platforms that we have been uh, involved with several of those. But now there are a few questions that um, have uh, come, have started coming in. Uh, someone asking for those uh, flat floating structures, have you looked into using the equivalent of quantum invisibility clocks? placing the columns and supports in specific locations to effectively make the platform invisible to ocean waves of a certain period via construct constructive destructive interference to impulse impo to improve stability stability in storms so again it's this clock if you like um, uh, idea has it been applied or has it been thought of in the offshore industry I, I have to say, I don't know, but I've written it down. I'm going to look into it. I, I honestly have not encountered that, but it sounds like a very interesting and intriguing uh, uh, thing to look at. And I, I, I've written that down. Um, yeah, if you, whoever had sent that question, want to send me a, a note privately, I'm very curious to learn more. Yeah, that's good. So another question that comes up has to do with uh, those um, um, Turbines, the sort of offshore turbines. Um, at this stage, uh, Steve, uh, do you know at which depths they have been installed? The highest depths they have been installed at? <clears throat> I, I don't know off the top of my head. I know that uh, in, in in some of the fixed wind farm installations, there's there there are a couple hundred meters. There are some floating turbines. Mm -hmm. uh, I know off Portugal and a couple of areas experimental. I honestly don't know the water depth. I, I know the guy involved in it, <laughs> but I don't know the water depths of it. But uh, it certainly is no no real restriction to that compared to other mm -hmm. offshore platforms. Mm -hmm. It's really an economic restriction. Uh, what What is it going to cost to do that? I'm sure turbine for turbine installing individual floating platforms for them is going to going to run up a bit on the cost. But yeah, I don't have the numbers on that, but I'm sure you could a quick Google search. You would find that very quickly. Thank um, you. The, one farm development I've been actually consulting on recently is, you know, maybe in 100 feet of water. So the foundations for these things are pretty straightforward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, so another question came up. Um, how is cost competitiveness in a down cycle offshore market? Are most wind farms new built or repurposed oil structures? I have not seen a repurposed one, partly because you really have different functional requirements. Uh, I, I suppose there's a case where you might, but with typical wind farm, you've got maybe a hundred turbines and each one has to have its own foundation. They have to be spaced significantly apart from one another to get the true efficiency of the field. So it's, it's a little bit uncommon to reuse a fixed platform for the simple reason that you've got to have exactly the same water depth to, to, to do it. So each of those turbines is going to be a little bit of a custom water depth to do that from the, the uh, power station. So, so every one of these has some kind of an offshore power substation, right? That gathers from these turbines. That's an area of opportunity there because it, it, in shallower water, you're, you're again limited to you know, harvesting a existing platform with, with the right water depth requirements. In deeper water, when you talk about floaters, that actually is, is a lot easier to do. I, personally, I would think what you're going to run into is the size of the floaters probably isn't as conducive. Well, that's not true. You know, the payload on these, these, these power, power stations is pretty substantial. So, yes, I think there's definitely some opportunity, particularly for things like a semi or a ship shape or a barge of some sort. A TLP, again, they get very water, water depth specific, but a free floater, there's no risers to a, other than the, the uh, transmission lines to, to, to a uh, offshore substation. So it's a little easier. You don't need the restricted motion. Sorry, I'm mm -hmm. talking off the top of my head. It's an interesting idea. 
and I, I would look at chips as well and, and other applications um, because honestly, mm -hmm. it can bob up and down quite a, quite a bit before you're going to have a problem with the transmission cables if the water is deep enough. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, another question came in. In uh, the case of fixed platforms, is there any ratio, preset ratio of the free surface area where the um, fixed is, platform is to the bottom area? Is there any particular ratio? So the, yeah, the batter, no, I think the, 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 the straight answer is no. Um, and you'll see platforms, you'll even see some that are almost vertical, depending on the, the situation. Um, <clears throat> it's really a design choice because you have a, you have a footprint you need at the top for your functional requirements. And so the rest of it, yes, the batter helps in some of the lateral load distribution, but, but it kind of depends, right? You can have more legs and less batter, you can have less legs and more legs. A lot of platforms in the older days were rectangular in form, so you would line the long direction with the uh, pre 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 prevalent direction of the weather. So the, the short answer is it depends, but mm -hmm. there certainly is a range. And, and I mean, it's not, you're not gonna have 20 degrees. <laughs> You know, yeah, it's going yeah. to be in that 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 five, ten, ten degree range. But yeah, it really is on your specifics of your design, and you have a, a load, and how 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 wide does your you yeah. think about the footprint of the piles? It's a it's a moment resistance, right? So it's a it's a, uh, a moment of inertia to to support that. Great, great. Thank you, Steve. There are a couple of other questions. We have a few more moments, a couple of minutes. Uh, one has to do with offshore wind turbines. Um, the question has to do with the dynamic loads coming from uh, the wind, I guess, versus those coming from the waves. Is that adding to the challenge? Uh, have there been advances from both? Um, it, it, well, certainly, obviously, the, the load on the turbine is the primary load for a, a, a turbine platform. But there's also a lot of science that goes into the turbines because, precisely because the, the uh, yeah, the revolution of the turbine is the money maker. Um, so no, it's not out of the ordinary the, the 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 size of loads and things. I mean, obviously there's a little bit of dynamic that goes with it, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, that's well within the the range of the skill sets we have. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So another very important question: uh, Why are FPSOs less common in the Gulf of Mexico versus West Africa, Brazil, Guyana, etc.? That's a really good question. It really comes down to commitment to pipeline infrastructure. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, the oil industry started out in the shelf and it was just massive, you know, for, for 30 years, there were literally thousands of platforms built in the Mississippi Delta area and they were all in very shallow water in shelf areas. And so they built a pipeline network to bring all that back in. When we stepped out into deep water, it was more economic to bring additional pipeline infrastructure than to start investing in FPSOs and, and offloading type technologies. In a place like Brazil, they made a different choice. Mm -hmm. uh, and because it was mostly developed by a national oil company, they could make strategic choices. And their choice was not to build a pipeline infrastructure. And if you look at the Campos Basin, the Santos Basin, it is a bit more spread out, but it was a conscious choice, an economic choice, a business model, if you will, that they chose to use um, FPSOs and shuttle tankers and offloading. Now, changing ever so slightly, they put in some gas lines and things. Uh, in other locations, it's a question of remoteness. Um, is it? But, but it really comes down to: Is there enough development that you can afford to build pipelines? Because it's cheaper if you have pipelines. Um, mm. So that's that's really what it boils down to. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. There are a couple of other questions that we cannot pick up at this uh, point. Uh, again, Steve, I want to thank you very much for this insightful uh, lecture. Thank you for putting the effort to make it so appealing, I think. That was great. Uh, thanks again and uh, wish you the best. Thank you for having me. Okay, bye-bye. So, Javier, all yours.
Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Dr. Spiros. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Kenevis Smith, and I want to formally thank each of you for joining today's webinar. We hope the conversation was valuable. Next, we wanted to highlight a few of our professional development short courses and future webinars. As you've heard today, lifelong learning and technical adaptability is fundamental in preparing individuals to remain competitive in today's workforce. If you enjoyed our fantastic speaker, you can learn more from him in our Fundamentals of Offshore Structure Certificate Program. The certificate consists of three independent short courses that will be held this April. The courses include Fundamentals of Offshore Structures, Design of Fixed Offshore Platforms, and Design of Floating Production Systems. No prerequisites are required, so complete our survey today to learn more about special discounts for you for participating in today's webinar. Additionally, Texas Engineering is now offering a 100% online petroleum engineering graduate certificate in data analytics, specifically built for the oil and gas industry. Data analytics is always a hot topic, but this certificate program is designed to help oil and gas professionals use data specifically for their industry. The certificate is a graduate level coursework that receives transcript credit that can be applied towards a master's degree. If you are in the oil and gas industry and data analytics is something that interests you, visit our website to learn more about how this certificate can give you the tools to optimize the processes and systems that you use every day. Our simple application process is only one click away, so let us know if you would like to learn more and wants to receive more information. Next, we wanted to highlight some of our upcoming skills related courses with our Rig School Operations course. This program has been around for over 35 years with participants from all over the world. If you or your organization need, organization need additional training in this area, please contact our PTEX department today. Next, we also wanted to thank the three units of the Cockrell School of Engineering that helped put this wonderful program together. First is the Texas Engineering Executive Education who works to reskill and upskill companies current workforce, either through our master's degree programs, graduate certificates or short courses. So if you have a need around STEM education or training, make sure to contact our department to learn more. Next is our Petroleum Extension of Texas, or PTEX, which has been around for over 75 years, serving oil and gas professionals with skills training, either through e-learning, publications, and online and in-person training. We have the training to meet your oil and gas needs. And last but not least is our research relations team. This team partners with industry to solve some of the world's biggest problems in energy, water, transportation, and many more. The Office of Research Relations works to facilitate and derive high value from research collaborations between companies and UT researchers. If your company would like to partner with the university to explore additional research opportunities, please email the Research Relations Office to initiate a discovery discussion. All three units are here to serve you and your company through education, training, and research. So feel free to contact us at any time and we would love to collaborate on helping you reach your company's full potential. As we continue in our text talk series, I wanted to make sure you are aware of our upcoming webinar. On March 26, Dr. Joan Burdenke will be discussing CO2 capture with ionic liquids. We hope each of you would join us for our future webinar, so mark your calendars today. If you would like to provide feedback on today's webinar or to learn more about receiving CEUs, make sure you complete the evaluation survey in the chat or in, the, in your email following this presentation. Once again, we'd like to thank you for joining us today. We hope you have a great weekend and hook them horns.